Here is Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, under the direction of Al Lewis. But first... Probably no city in the world is as newsworthy as Hollywood, California. How often have you seen headlines that read, Movie star does so-and-so, or Hollywood hero in nightclub brawl? If it happened to anyone else in any other town, it wouldn't get more than a few lines on page 10. But from Hollywood, it's front-page news. Our soldiers overseas are in about the same spot as movie stars. Attention is focused on them constantly. If one serviceman gets out of line, he's taken as a sample of the entire American army. But we're grateful that the percentage is small. Most of our fellows know that a big part of their job is to build up goodwill between ourselves and other people. But the few who do get into serious trouble make it a lot tougher for the majority who are trying to do a good job. Our servicemen are doing a lot to correct false ideas about America, and they're on the spot, just like a Hollywood star. The clean lights are burning, the cameras are rolling, and the whole world is watching to see how they act. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. As it must to all school teachers, final exam time came last week to our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School. That's why Friday morning found me in the dinette for an early and hurried breakfast. My landlady was most cooperative. My fruit juice, Mrs. Davis? Fruit juice, Connie. Cereal? Cereal. Toast? Toast. Coffee? Coffee. Hat coat and bicarbonate? Hat coat. <laughs> Stop teasing, Connie. You don't have to rush like this. I suppose you're right, Mrs. Davis. I did get the test finished last night. At least it finished to my satisfaction. Now, if our beloved principal likes it, everything's okay. How's Mr. Conklin been lately? His uh, temper, I mean. Well, for the past week, he's only been (laughs) semi-apoplectic. Honestly, he's so autocratic sometimes... Oh, that must be Walter Denton. I'll get it. It's pretty early for Walter, isn't it? He's been getting up on time lately to hear a new program. Some disc jockey called Out of the World Oscar. (laughs) Excuse me, Mrs. Davis. Hold on to your beanie, jazz mad. I'm coming. Good morning, Miss Brooks. (laughs) Mr. Conklin. Oh, come in, sir. May I, uh... May you take my beanie? (laughs) No. No, Miss Brooks. I don't want the propellers dented. I'm sorry. I thought it was Walter Denton at the door. I was just finishing breakfast, Mr. Conklin. Would you care for a cup of coffee or something? I could do with a cup. Thank you, Miss Brooks. Come on into the dinette. Mrs. Davis will be surprised to see you, Mr. Conklin. You haven't stopped by in quite a while. Mrs. Davis, look who's here. Well, Osgood Conklin. Good morning, Margaret. Mr. Conklin says he could do with a cup of coffee, Mrs. Davis. I'll heat some up in a jiffy. Just make yourself comfortable. How about a slice of toast with your coffee? I could do with a slice of toast, yes. Do some toast while you're doing the coffee, Mrs. Davis. Uh, Davis. Sit right down here, Mr. Conklin. Thank you. Uh, Miss Brooks, this is not to be construed as a social call. I was on my way to the engravers nearby and decided to kill two birds with one stone. Mrs. Davis and me? Very amusing. (laughs) Miss Brooks, you have probably forgotten that this is the time of year when some fortunate student receives the highest honor Madison has to offer. The coveted silver loving cup so thoughtfully provided by our school's beloved founder, Yoda Critch. Say, 
say, it is getting pretty close to critch time, isn't it? <laughs> this award, affording added incentive to all students, has always been presented to that pupil who exhibits superior aptitude in mastering that glorious linguistic infant, that heterogeneous hybrid of sundry tongues, the English language. <laughs> Now then, Miss Brooks, do you recognize my problem? Of course. How to get those words on a cup without having most of them slop over into the saucer. <laughs> that is only part of the difficulty. Before taking any action, however, I want you, as the teacher who will be giving the examination, to have a full say in all decisions concerning the award. Well, thank you, Mr. Conklin. That's Since very... brevity is sorely needed here... I have been casting about for the one word that would sum up the essence of this prize. How about... Then, too, instead of giving a test with merely straight questions, I thought I'd consult with you about the possibility of having a brief composition form a part of it. Well, that A all. composition that could be judged, <laughs> along with the questions, of course, not only on neatness and penmanship, but also originality of basic thought, clever phraseology, and so forth. That seems... The word which... <laughs> Those qualities of which we chatted earlier seems to me to be the correct one to place upon the cup. However, before going to the engravers, I made up my mind to do nothing without your go-ahead, Miss Brooks. Well, I do. After all, <laughs> it's only fair that you should have a hand in this. Now, it seems to me, appending your approval naturally... Natch, I got that in. <laughs> It seems that the word unique most closely typifies what we're at. Unique means unmatched, without an equal, unlike anything else. So, Miss Brooks, how about having the inscription read, The Yoda Critch Award for Unique Achievement in English? I knew you'd like <laughs> Then the matter is closed. Here's your toast and coffee, Osgood. Oh, thank you. Well... We certainly accomplished a lot while you were in the kitchen, Margaret. Yes, indeed. Just shows you what can be done when Mr. Conklin and I put his head together. <laughs> uh, it's teamwork that counts, a spirit of cooperation. Oh, that must be Walter now. Excuse me. Greetings, oh, fairest of all possible English teachers. <laughs> Morning, most observant of all possible pupils. <laughs> Come on in, Walter. You see before you a bearer of cheerful tidings. You are hereby invited to a party tonight. Oh, thanks, Walter. I have some tidings for you, too. Come on into the dinette. Okay, Miss Brooks. I just called Harriet Conklin to invite her to the party, and she told me her father was really on the warpath this morning. He couldn't find one of his socks or something. And uh, not now, Walter. <laughs> really blew his horn. I can just see him stomping around giving orders. And get me this, get me that. You do this, you do that. Good morning, Denton. Hi, <laughs> hey, Mr. Conklin. I was just telling Miss Brooks about old Grouch Pooh. <laughs> Crawl into my coffee cup, Walter. <laughs> Making waves. Can I get you something, Walter? Cup of coffee, glass of milk, shot of arsenic. <laughs> I'll be running along now. But what about your toast, Osgood? Aren't you going to eat it? I seem to have lost my appetite. <laughs> I'll see you to the door, Mr. Conklin. Hey, don't bother. I'll let myself out, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Osgood. Goodbye, Margaret. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin, sir. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and to think I wanted a boy. Gosh, Miss Brooks, do you think Mr. Conklin knew I was talking about him? Oh, of course not, Walter. He probably thought we were chatting about the weather. <laughs> the weather? Yes, everybody knows it's been grouch puss out all week. <laughs> Now, have a glass of milk and forget about Mr. Conklin. 
What kind of a party is this tonight? Well, my pal Stretch Snodgrass is throwing it. It's a barbecue in back of his father's pet shop. There have been several of the teachers. The more tender ones, I hope. <laughs> it's a very romantic spot, Miss Brooks, and we've taken the liberty of inviting Mr. Boynton. Oh, you have? Sure. And we got it all figured out. The moon rises at exactly 7.20 p.m. Now, at 7.21, you and Mr. Boynton will sneak through an ivy-covered archway and stretch his backyard. Now, when you get through the archway, you come to a cute little bird bath. And guess what's in the bird bath? A dirty owl. <laughs> no. no, Miss Brooks, it's a pair of Mr. Snodgrass's prize lovebirds. Now, what do you think Mr. Boynton will do when he sees those lovebirds in the bird bath? Well, if I know Mr. Boynton, he'll close his eyes and hand them a towel. <laughs> no, he won't, no. Now, he'll watch the lovebirds and see what they're doing. Now, what do you suppose they are doing? What? They're rubbing their beaks together. <laughs> you see, it's their way of making love. And with Mr. Boynton standing right there with you, well, you know the old expression, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> monkey see, monkey do? Sure. Well, don't just sit there. Hand me a banana and let's get going. <laughs> Starring E. Barden will continue in just a moment, but first... On the back lots of the motion picture studios in Hollywood, they have what are known as permanent sets. These are outdoor sets made to look like New York streets or French villages or something you might see in Baghdad, London, or Tokyo. Standing in one spot, you can see reproductions of practically the whole world. It reminds you that improved methods of travel and communication have made the real world like that. More compact, more closely united. I think people today feel closer together, too. An earthquake in Ecuador becomes a matter of importance to relief organizations in countries all over the world. A disastrous fire in Paris can have its effect on the commerce of three continents. People are beginning to see that what hurts one country hurts all of us. What helps one group helps the whole world. Our servicemen overseas have done their part in spreading that idea. They have shown that the way of life we declare in our Constitution is not a matter of words, but something we believe in for all people. It's an important thing to remember when you're stationed in another land. A country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. at school a few minutes before it was time for my first class. So I decided to give Mr. Boynton an opportunity to invite me personally to stretch his barbecue. As I entered the biology laboratory, Mr. Boynton rose from his desk. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. We don't have too much time to chat, Mr. Boynton, so I'd better get right down to beating around the bush. <laughs> any plans for after school? Oh, yes, Miss Brooks, I have. Uh, this afternoon, I, I've got a heavy date. Oh? It's, it's with my little nephew. He's just four years old, and I'm taking him to his first movie. Oh, sounds like fun. <laughs> what about the evening, Mr. Boynton? Well, I've been invited to a party, Miss Brooks. A barbecue? That's right. It's Stretch Snodgrass's place. I've been invited to that party, too, Mr. Boynton. Really? Good. Yes. Now that you've been invited and I've been invited, there's only one more invitation necessary. One more? Oh, you want to bring somebody? <laughs> no, Mr. Boynton. I want somebody to bring me. You do? Uh, who, do you want to, who do you want to bring you, Miss Brooks? Who do I want to bring me what? <laughs> What? Oh, skip it. I'll see you later. I've got to get into my first class now. Well, uh, just a minute, Miss Brooks. If you weren't kidding about wanting somebody to take you to the party, 
How about going with me tonight? I'm sorry, Mr. Boynton. I couldn't possibly. Why not? I'm going with you. <laughs> that ought to confuse him nicely. <laughs> Some enchanted evening. I will... Oh. Excuse me, Miss Brooks. I didn't notice that you weren't looking where you were going. Well, that's all right, Stretch. I have a very forgiving nature. How's Madison star athlete feeling this lovely, sunny, pre-barbecue day? Well, physically I feel okay, Miss Brooks, but mentally... Say no more, Stretch. <laughs> As your English teacher for lo these many years, I'm well aware of your scholastic deficiencies, so let's not talk shop. How are plans coming along for the party tonight? Well, that's what I feel so punk about, Miss Brooks. I'm afraid there ain't going to be no party. Please, Stretch, there isn't going to be any party. You know about it already, huh? <laughs> know about what, Stretch? Well, I guess Walter told you what my old man, my father, said this morning. No, he didn't. My old man's... My father said that he's sick and tired of me not getting nowhere in my studies, and that all parties was out for the entire whole summer unless I won this here Yodar Critch Award for English. That sentence should win an award by itself. <laughs> but, Stretch, do I understand your old man, your father, <laughs> to mean that if you don't win the cup today, the barbecue is canceled? That's right. Then I'll have to disinvite all the people I invited. <laughs> I hate to do that, Miss Brooks. I hate to have you do it, Stretch. Tell me the truth. Have you studied for this test at all? Well, sure I have. I always study for everything. And for this English test, I study even harder than I ever done. Something done told me the barbecue is cooked. <laughs> Look, Stretch, there are still a few hours before the exam. Maybe you could get somebody to coach you. I thought of that, Miss Brooks. I was just going to ask Walter Denton to help me. Walter Denton? Sure. He's much smarter than me. Gosh, on the last test we took, he beat me by 20 points. Yes, I know. What a mark he got. Boy, 29. <laughs> Shows you what some last-minute cramming can do. But I don't think Walter's the ideal tutor for your stretch. Now, if Harriet Conklin would give you some pointers, you'd be... Wait a minute. Isn't that the happy couple going into my class? Sure, those are them. Hey, Walter, wait up. Hi, Stretch. Hello, Miss Brooks. Stretch. Hi. How are you two? Stretch. How are you two? We're okay, thanks. <laughs> Miss Brooks was just saying that if somebody coaches me a while, maybe I got a chance to get the cup after all. I didn't put it quite that way, but... Gee, it's certainly worth a try. I'd be willing to do whatever I could to help stretch out. Oh, say, that reminds me, Miss Brooks. Daddy wants you to pick up the cup and display it in your classroom this morning. It's in the custodian's office right now. Mr. Jensen? All right, Harriet, I'll get it. Meanwhile, you tell my class to take a study period. Then you kids can take stretch into one of these empty rooms and drill whatever you can into him. Okay, Miss Brooks. And who knows... As the moon rises over Stretch's barbecue pit tonight, you and Mr. Boynton may yet be plighting your trots beneath the bird bath. Well, I hope so, Walter. I'd hate to think I honed my beak for nothing. <laughs> Mr. Jensen, uh, may I come in, Mr. Jensen? You are in, Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, yes, I guess I am. You I... rapped on my door before entering, it's true. But then you failed to wait so much as a split second before opening it and entering upon the premises. Hence, your query falls into the classification of a purely rhetorical question. Maybe I'd better go out and come in again. <laughs> oh, not at all, Miss Brooks. You see, most of us employ altogether too many meaningless phrases in our daily conversation. I try to eliminate them. Well, you've got something there, Mr. Jensen. Where, Miss Brooks? <laughs> Look, I don't want to seem short with oh, you, but I... Oh, you don't seem short to me, Miss <laughs> In fact, you're a nice-sized woman. Thank you. And a pretty one, too, if I may say so. Who's stopping you? 
That is, I'd like to tell you what brought me oh, here. Oh, I know the answer to that one. The stork. <laughs> That's the sort of small joke, isn't it? It is sort of small, yes. The stork paid Mrs. Jensen a visit just eight weeks ago. Yes, I know. How is the little dear? We didn't have a deer. We had a boy. <laughs> yes, I play with him every night when I go home. He holds his head up all by himself. He must have very strong hands. <laughs> Look, Mr. Jensen, I just came by to pick up a loving cup Mr. Conklin left. Pick up, Miss Brooks? You can't possibly pick anything up unless it's beneath you. And the cup of which you speak is standing on that shelf right over your head. All right, Mr. Jensen. Then if you don't mind, and even if you do, I'll pick down the loving cup and blow. <laughs> Gee, Walter, I'm all muddled up. I even forget what Harriet said was an adverb. I'll never win that cup. Oh, don't be a quitter, Stretch. You want to have that big barbecue party, don't you? Sure, more than anything. But I'm just no good at English. Everything you tell me goes in both of my ears and out the other. <laughs> Stretch, you only have two ears. See, I'm no good at arithmetic either. <laughs> How's it coming? Oh, I'm afraid we haven't been much help, Miss Brooks. No, he's more confused than ever. Looks like it's up to you to pull Stretch through. Well, I'll try, but there isn't much time left. Here, kids, you take this cup into my room and get ready for the test yourselves. I'll be along with Stretch as soon as I feel he's mastered some of the fundamentals. Yeah, okay, Miss Brooks. Come on, Harriet. I'll carry the cup. All right, Walter. Good luck, Miss Brooks. You too, Stretch. Thanks. Now, Stretch... In this streamlined English course I'm about to give you, I'll be using a textbook which I consider difficult for even people. <laughs> I don't blame him, no how. <laughs> but stretch. The use of the word with in the sentence makes it prepositional. So perhaps I should explain the simple rule governing prepositional phrases before I can expect you to understand possessive pronouns. Yeah, maybe that's what's clogging up my mind, Miss Brooks. <laughs> maybe if you read me about them prepositional things, I might see the whole thing clear. Well, here is the rule, Stretch. A prepositional phrase, a subordinate clause, or a participial phrase may take the place of a noun in almost any of its relations. Thus, the sentence, for him to use the society's money was dishonest, affords us a case in which an infinitive, to use, serving as a noun, the object of the preposition for, as a verb, takes a subject in him, and an object in money, and the whole unites to form the subject of the verb was, and is qualified by the adjective dishonest. Is that clear? <laughs> well, Stretch? My pop won't even let me dance with my mother. a reluctant farewell to the prepositional phrase and plunge headlong into the subjunctive mood. Rule. If I say I'm John the Fisherman, I am making a positive statement, flatly stating that I am indeed John the Fisherman. The Fisherman acting in apposition with the noun John, which it explains. But, if the words, if I were, precede the noun, the sentence is placed in the subjunctive mood, indicating that the supposition is not a possibility. Thus, if I say, if I were John the Fisherman, the verb were makes it obvious that I am not John the Fisherman. For if I were John the Fisherman, I would simply say, I am John the Fisherman. <laughs> What's my name? I mean, I mean am or am I not John the Fisherman if I say, if I were John the Fisherman? Well, that's easy. You ain't John the Fisherman, Miss Brooks. You're right, I ain't. But how do you know I ain't John the Fisherman? Because <laughs> if you was John the Fisherman, you'd be carrying fish instead of that crazy book. <laughs> At last, you've grasped the fundamentals. On to the test. <laughs> Come to order, class. <laughs> now, before 
revealing the winner of the Yodar Critch Award for Unique Achievement in English, I should like to introduce the two gentlemen at my desk. On my right, Madison's popular biology teacher who assisted me in marking the test papers, Mr. Philip Boynton. Thank you, students. And on my left, Madison High's beloved principal, Mr. Conklin. Thank you, Harriet. (laughs) Students, I am as eager as any of you to learn the identity of the lucky pupil who has won this coveted cup. Miss Brooks, would you kindly make the announcement? Yes, sir. The winner is Stretch Snodgrass. Huh? 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 (laughs) Miss Brooks, is this some kind of a joke? No, sir. According to your own definition, unique means unmatched and without an equal. Therefore, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you, Stretch Snodgrass, this silver loving cup. Gee, thanks, Miss Brooks. Would you tell me one thing? What's that, Stretch? How did I do it? By being unique. In all my experience as a teacher, you are the first student who ever completed an exam without answering one question correctly. (laughs) Bird bath, anyone? Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Alsberg and Al Lewis, with the music of Lud Bluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. This program came to you from the Frankfurt Studios of the American Forces Network Europe, and was prepared for rebroadcast over this network by specialist Ed Barron. your entertainment and pleasure, here is Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. (laughs) It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, under the direction of Al Lewis. But first... A recent news announcement gave added proof to the old saying, it's a small world. In fact, it's even smaller than we thought. The Army Map Service, using an improved way of measuring the equatorial radius of the Earth, found that it's exactly 420 feet shorter than previously figured. But the Earth is shrinking in another sense, too. The telegraph, radio, telephone, all the improved methods of communication have made it pretty small. We get all the news from around the world almost as it happens. And there's more understanding in a world where nations and people can compare notes, ask questions, exchange information. Our servicemen are an important part of this international gab fest. They're right on the spot in a lot of different countries where they have a chance to talk to the people, get their viewpoints, and give them ours. One of the most effective weapons they carry is truth. Before we can have agreement between nations, we have to have understanding between people. That's part of the assignment we give to our ambassadors in uniform. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. Well, for many of us, the early morning hours aren't the most cheerful time of the day. So it is with our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School. Fortunately, however, by the time we've had our second cup of coffee, most of us feel a good deal better. How true that is. I always feel quite a bit better after my second cup of coffee, which I have at 7.30 in the evening. (laughs) But when some extremely fortunate occurrence is impending, I can even be cheerful at breakfast. That was the case last Friday when I joined my landlady in the dinette. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. My, you're in a good humor this morning, Connie. It is grand to hear you singing like this. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. I've got a wonderful feeling. Everything's going my way. (laughs) 
And it's such a nice song, too. The beautiful Blue Danube. Strausses <laughs> have always been my favorite. The Strausses, mine too. I wouldn't get my meat anyplace else. <laughs> This reminds me of the last time you were in such high spirits. I'll never forget that morning. You flitted around like a gay little bird. When was that, Mrs. Davis? The day you found out that Mr. Conklin had to stay in bed with the flu. <laughs> I've got even better news than that today. You mean Mr. Conklin's resigned? Please, Mrs. Davis. Let's not wish for the moon. <laughs> But I did hear that Miss Enright is leaving school for the rest of the semester. She is? Yes. It seems her spinster sister is ill upstate. So Miss Enright's gotten a leave of absence and she's going up to nurse her. You mean Miss Enright's going to nurse her spinster sister for the rest of the semester? Yes. Oh, she'll nurse the spinster sister for the rest of the semester <laughs> and away we'll go. Ooh. Oh, forgive me, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> I can't get that blue Danube out of my head. <laughs> well, I know Daisy Enright's always been a rival of yours, Connie, so I can't blame you for being happy about her going. This leaves you a clear field with Mr. Boynton, doesn't it? Exactly. Now there's nothing between Mr. Boynton and me except Mr. Boynton. <laughs> You don't seem so enthusiastic about the news. Frankly, I'm not. Miss Enright's been conducting the course in Red Cross First Aid I've been taking three nights a week. Well, cheer up, Mrs. Davis. Even if the course is discontinued, you can take it again next season. But I was hoping to get some practical experience, Connie. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Walter Denton to drive me to school. Be right with you, Walter. Mm -hmm. If you want first aid experience, Mrs. Davis, why don't you come out to the car and watch us take off? <laughs> take off? Yes, the way Walter starts that jalopy, it's ten to one I'll bang my head on the windshield. <laughs> that we're on our way, let's have a nice, smooth ride to school, Walter. Okay, Miss Brooks. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry you banged your head on the windshield when we started. Oh, forget it. It's only a flesh wound. <laughs> Just try to control your tendency to speed, won't you? Yeah, I'll try. But it's awfully difficult on a beautiful day like today. I think I know how you feel, Walter. I'm rather related, too. And I'll bet our joy stems from the same source, the imminent departure of one Daisy Enright. I couldn't be any happier if two Daisy Enrights were leaving. <laughs> I mean, Miss Enright's a very good teacher, Walter. Why should you be happy to see her go? Well, because my mother's been taking her first aid course, and everything she studies she tries out on my father and me. Well, you shouldn't complain about that, Walter. Your mother's just trying to learn how to take better care of her family. Yeah, she sure took care of me last Monday. Seems she had to do some splint practice, so naturally she used me. You seem a little flexible for a splint, Walter. <laughs> no, she put the splint on my leg, Miss Brooks. And then, then she told me to walk across the room. And did you? I took one step and fell on my face. <laughs> what did your mother do then? She bandaged my face. <laughs> but with six yards of sterile gauze. <laughs> Could have used more, but my dad had nine yards wrapped around him. Your house must have looked like an Arab settlement. <laughs> well, with Miss Enright leaving, they'll probably discontinue the class until next year anyhow. But surely you've had similar experiences to mine. Mrs. Davis takes the same course. Doesn't she practice on you? No, Walter. Luckily, I've been out a good deal of the time. Mrs. Davis does all her first aid practicing on our next-door neighbor. Oh, Mrs. Landfield? That's right. Limpy Landfield, we call her. <laughs> Hi, Miss Brooks. Didn't Walter drive you to school today? Yes, Harriet. He'll be along in a minute. Oh, you certainly look radiant this morning, Miss Brooks. What's the reason for the big smile? 
I just told you Walter drove me to school, Harriet. I always smile when I get out of his car alive. <laughs> Whatever the reason, I'm glad you're so cheerful, Miss Brooks. Thank you, Harriet. Oh, before I forget, Daddy wants to see you in his office immediately. Have you any idea what he wants to see me about? No, but he sounded even more urgent than usual. You better get right on in, Miss Brooks. Very well, Harriet. I'll see you in class. Good luck, Miss Brooks. Enter. <laughs> uh, you wanted to see me, Mr. Conklin? I could answer more truthfully if you rephrased the question. <laughs> There's something about which you must see me? Uh, that's better. Yes. <laughs> Sit down, please. Now, I don't know whether or not you're aware of it, but our school is about to suffer a grievous loss. Miss Enright is leaving. I know. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> Please try to control your sobs. Since her sister is ailing, I've granted Miss Enright a leave of absence effective at once. You see, there's no one else to take care of the poor creature. And so Miss Enright will have to nurse her spinster sister for the rest of the semester. Exactly, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Believe me, it is with deep regret that I'll bid farewell to Miss Enright. She embodies all those qualities I most esteem in a teacher. She's very capable, Mr. Conklin, and I'm sure that uh, she's you... She's more than capable, Miss Brooks. When Miss Enright goes, I can't help feeling that some part of our school is going with her. Well, we shouldn't begrudge her a few pencils and erasers. <laughs> I mean, she'll be back in the fall, Mr. Conklin. I sincerely hope so. Now then, since it is too late in the season to hire outside help, this vacancy must be filled by other members of our faculty assuming additional duties. I think I just heard the school bell, Mr. Conklin, so if you'll excuse me. Uh, there was no bell, Miss Brooks. <laughs> But, uh, although her classes will be taken over by Mr. Chalmers, Miss Enright leaves another most important post to be filled. Namely, the Red Cross first aid course she conducted three nights a week. There goes that bell again. Be seated, Miss Brooks. In mentioning this post to you, I must remind you that in spite of the high honor that goes with the office, there is absolutely no financial recompense whatsoever. That bell is getting louder every minute. <laughs> Look, Mr. Conklin, it's been years since I got my certificate in first aid. Since and... the Red Cross, like Madison High itself, is run on a purely democratic basis, one may only serve it by exercising one's own free choice to serve. It's purely voluntary. But how do you know I'll volunteer, Mr. Conklin? Miss Brooks. <laughs> Do you have a large bank account? I know, sir. And is teaching the only profession with which you're familiar? That's right, sir. And would you like to continue to make a living in this profession, Miss Brooks? Certainly, sir. Well, <laughs> well then. I hereby exercise my own free, democratic, voluntary choice of saying yes. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment. But first, if you were a millionaire and changed all the money you owned into single-dollar bills and pressed those bills together as tightly as you could, you couldn't compress them into a single solitary tree. A tree takes years to grow and mature, and no amount of money can buy that. That's why, even if you're a millionaire, you can't afford a forest fire. On the other hand, even if you don't have a million in the bank, you can still afford the moment or two it takes to make sure a cigarette or matchstick is fully extinguished before you toss it away. And no one is so poor he can't afford that little bit of effort that dousing a campfire requires. Be careful whenever you're in or around a forest area. Help prevent forest fires. I had to take over Daisy Enright's first aid course didn't help my appetite any. 
Nevertheless, when lunchtime came, I went to the school cafeteria, baited a table with meatloaf, and sat down to wait for Mr. Boynton. But as I toyed with my salad, it was Miss Enright's voice that broke in on my reverie. Well, Miss Brooks, as I live and breathe. Two faults that are easily remedied. <laughs> well, what are you doing, darling? Feeding your full little face again? <laughs> what do you mean, again? I haven't had anything to eat since... What do you mean, full little face? <laughs> Just take it easy, darling. We've all got our troubles. Look. Look at what's happening with my poor sister, for instance. It's such a pathetic case. Picture, if you can, a poor, lonely spinster with hardly a friend in the world, practically no one to turn to. I sympathize with you, Miss Enright. Now tell me about your sister. <laughs> of humor. No, but there's something I want to discuss with you. Do you mind if I sit down here for a moment? Not at all. I can't digest this food anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks, I understand that you've been requested to complete my first aid course. Or is the word volunteered? The word is railroaded. <laughs> what I can't figure out is why Mr. Conklin picked on me. Oh, you were a natural for the job, my dear. Otherwise, I would never have recommended you. You recommended me. Oh, dear. Now the cat is out of the bag, isn't it? I don't blame you for being self-conscious. <laughs> Mrs. Brooks, are you inferring... If the bag fits, get back in it. <laughs> it's all right. You're really going out in the blaze of infamy, aren't you? Going out? Oh, Oh, but that's what I sat down to tell you, darling. I'm not going anyplace. My sister has decided to come down here and live with me. Isn't that a relief? It's such a relief, I may kill myself. <laughs> well, at least I won't have to conduct those classes of yours. Oh, but you will, darling. That's one of the provisions I made when I agreed to stay. I told Mr. Conklin that I'd have to spend all my free time with my sister, and he said that he didn't mind a bit as long as you took over for me. As one English teacher to another, Miss Enright, I'd just like to say that I am the one who has been took over. <laughs> I just don't think it's fair for you to... Good afternoon, ladies. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Oh, no, not a thing, Mr. Boynton. Miss Brooks was speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you sit down? Oh, thanks, Miss Enright. That food you've got looks very appetizing, Mr. Boynton. Oh, yes, I thought I'd take a whirl at the pot roast today. But I kept this plate of meatloaf covered for you, Mr. Boynton. Oh, I can probably handle them both. I'm starved. <laughs> oh, my, that roast looks yummy. <laughs> and so does the meatloaf. Would you care to try one or the other, Miss Enright? Why don't you try both, Miss Enright? You can feed one of your faces, and I'll feed the other. <laughs> Uh, I think Miss Brooks is a trifle miffed because she's going to have to take over some of my duties. Oh, yes, I, I heard you were leaving, Miss Enright. When are you going? Surprise, surprise. I'm not going at all, Mr. Boynton. You're not? No. Well, well, that is a pleasant bit of news. Did you hear that, Miss Brooks? Miss Enright's staying on. She's not leaving at all. Isn't that just splendid? <laughs> Oh, eat your pot roast. <laughs> My dear sister is coming to live with me, Mr. Boynton. I'm going to take care of her. Oh, I see. Well, well that'll keep you pretty close to home most evenings, won't it? Oh, oh, I don't know. One can't look after one's sister every night. Now can one? If one doesn't go out until one's asked, one can. <laughs> must excuse me. I've got several things to do. Oh, do you have to go so soon, Miss Brooks? I'm afraid I do, Mr. Boynton. Here's your check for the meatloaf. Oh, uh, thank you, Miss Brooks. But uh, where, uh, well, where is, is your... Uh, uh, I paid my check, Mr. Boynton. Oh, well, uh, so long. <laughs> Toodle. I'll be 
before you go, darling, I'd like to remind you that I'm coming over to your house tonight to brush you up on the first aid course. It was Mr. Conklin's idea. What? As a matter of fact, he's coming along with me. But I didn't plan on... He said we'd be there at 8 sharp, Miss Brooks, so you'd better be ready at that time. You know, this first aid course is Mr. Conklin's pet project. Uh, Sort of like Mr. Boynton is to certain other members of the faculty. (laughs) If you know what I mean, dear Mr. Boynton. (laughs) Huh? (laughs) I guess it's safe to leave him here for a few minutes. The Emperor has spoken. I guess I'll see you tonight, Miss Enright. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Uh, goodbye, Miss Brooks. Oh, uh, don't stop at the dessert counter, dear. From the back, those calories show like mad. <laughs> if I could plead manslaughter, I'd kill her. <laughs> From all the unjust, tyrannical... I'll take it easy, Miss Brooks. You know what talking to yourself is the first sign of, don't you? Yes, Walter, but I don't care. Oh, things can't be that terrible. Tell Uncle Walt what's the matter. (laughs) It's pretty bad, (laughs) Unc. Miss Enright just told me that she and Mr. Conklin are coming over to my place tonight to brush me up on her first aid course. What's so bad about that? This is a chance to kill two of your favorite birds with one stone. If you're going to show them what you remember from your first date experience, you'll get a chance to not only clobber Miss Enright, but to show Mr. Conklin that you're totally unfit to take over the job. Well, Miss Brooks, what do you think of the scheme? Walter, if we were in France, I'd kiss you on both cheeks and give you the Legion of Honor. Good evening, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Conklin, Miss Enright. Come in, won't you? Thank you. Just leave your coats and heads out here. A hat (laughs) out here. (laughs) Thank you, darling. Well, are you all prepared for your refresher course? I really don't think it'll be necessary, Miss Enright. You see, I've been rereading my manual, and you'd be surprised how quickly the things I'd learned came back to me. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, Miss Brooks. But if you're going to instruct others, I'd like to see some practical demonstration of this knowledge. Of course, sir. Just follow me into the living room, please. As you can see, I've moved most of the furniture into one corner of the room, and I've got the splints, bandages, and adhesive all ready. Excellent. Now then, let's get right to business. We will suppose that our subject has sustained a fractured elbow and a broken ankle. Let's make it two broken ankles. (laughs) Very well, two broken ankles. Now then, lie down, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir. Then we can... Wait a minute. Why should I lie down? If someone had sustained two broken ankles and a fractured elbow, is it too unreasonable to assume she'd be lying down? (laughs) No, sir, but the wrong bones are being broken. That is, I want to show you what I know about first aid. Miss Enright's the one who must lie down. Oh, you want me to pretend I've been through an accident? Believe me, it's typecasting. <laughs> Just crumpled, dear. The rug is spotless so far. <laughs> well, now, 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 let, let's get on with it. Do as she says, Miss Enright. Oh, very well. Now, we'll assume that Miss Enright has been in an automobile accident, and besides having both arms broken, she's in an acute state of shock. Shock? Well, how do I react? As if Mr. Boynton finally asked you for a date. <laughs> is to kneel by her side and take care of the arm. This silk sleeve seems to be covering up the injury. Oh, Miss Brooks, this is a brand new dress. Please, what do you want to be, neat or cured? <laughs> now, it's, it's obvious from the looks of this arm that it's badly injured. Where my fingers touch, it's all black and blue. See, Mr. Conklin? Where? Where is it black and blue? Ouch! Right there. <laughs> Now, hand me that catsup bottle, please, Mr. Conklin. Well, here you are, but what's it for? Realism. This was a pretty bad accident, remember? Oh, Brooks, you're ruining my dress. Quiet, you're in a state of shock. <laughs> now we'll start bandaging the arm. First, I put the splint gently against the skin. Oh! <laughs> then I start the roller bandage here. 
Now I wrap the gauze with one arm this way. Yes, go on. Then I put the other arm through and tie the bandage this way. Now I reverse the process, again bringing the other arm through the bandage and wrapping it securely. Uh, now what? Now if someone will untie my arms, I'll continue. <laughs> Uh, Miss Brooks, can you or can you not tie a firm bandage? This splint was a bit too rough, Mr. Conklin, but if Miss Enright will let me use one of her legs... Now, see here, Miss Brooks. Now, please, please cooperate, Miss Enright. Stand up and let's see if Miss Brooks can tie a firm bandage on your leg. Well, if you insist, Mr. Conklin, there. Now then, Mr. Conklin, if you'll just stand nearby and hand me a few things... Very well, very well. Uh, First, please pass me the adhesive. Uh, Here you are. Now, we'll take down your stocking, Miss Enright. There. And wrap this adhesive nice and tight. There. Oh, Miss Brooks, but you don't put adhesive next to the skin. First, the bandage must come. You're so right, darling. Off you come, adhesive. And, oh, uh, hand me a splint, please, Mr. Conklin. Uh, here, here. The idea is to get a good, steady support for the leg. Around we go with the bandage, all around the splint. Another bandage, please, Mr. Conklin. Uh, here's one. Now we wrap this around the other one. Now the adhesive, round and round and round. There. How does that feel? Solid? Very, Very solid. Very solid. Good grief, you've tied Miss Enright's leg to mine. <laughs> I thought one of those legs had more wool on it than the other. (laughs) Will you please get this bandage untied? I'll have to tear this splint out first. (laughs) Ouch! There's a big splinter right in my thumb. Good. Now, for your next test, let's suppose that somebody's got a big splinter right in his thumb. Oh, I'll get it. Mr. Boynton, come on in. Well, I just dropped by to return a book I borrowed from Mrs. Davis, but... I... Oh, you've got company. Please join us, Mr. Boynton. All right. Oh, good evening, Mr. Conklin, Miss Enright. Say, what are you doing, having a three-legged race? <laughs> Don't be funny, Boynton. (laughs) There has been an accident. (laughs) What's that on Miss Enright's dress? Oh, no. A biology teacher who faints at the sight of catsup. I didn't faint, Miss Brooks. I I just slipped on this scatter rug. (laughs) Well, stop jabbering, everyone. I've got to get this splinter removed. Would you like me to probe, Mr. Conklin? Keep away from me, you angel of destruction. Never fear, Mr. Conklin. Daisy Enright's on the job. I'll get it out for you in just a jiffy. Now, here's a nice clean pin. Now, give Daisy your thumb. Come on, come to Daisy. Down, Daisy, down, girl. (laughs) Here. Here, Miss Enright. Now, please be careful. Oh, there's nothing to it, Mr. Conklin. There, it's out. Say, that didn't hurt a bit. Remarkable, Miss Enright. You know, everyone should master first aid. I've been thinking of taking that course myself. You have? Yes. I'd like to sign up right now for the balance of the semester. It's a deal. Monday night at 8, I throw out the first bandage. Over my limp carcass, you do. (laughs) Miss Enright? I'll move heaven and earth if you'll take over your old course. Oh, well, that won't be necessary, Mr. Conklin. Now. She's halfway to heaven already. <laughs> oh, well, Miss Enright, there's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, Miss Brooks? 
What sort of splint does one use after one cuts one's throat? <laughs> Our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. They say that Michelangelo, the artist, was able to draw a perfect circle freehand. You think that's easy? Just try it sometime. Anyhow, whenever he made a call on a friend and the friend was out, he used to leave a card with a perfect circle on it. And everyone knew that Michelangelo had been there. It's rather odd how friendship and circles seem to go together. We talk about the family circle and the circle of friends. That's probably why we think of the whole world as just an overgrown neighborhood. In a neighborhood, we sometimes have misunderstandings and disagreements, but we work things out, visiting over the back fence, exchanging recipes and ideas, helping someone with his garden. Those all have their counterparts on the international scene. Right now, the biggest visitors in the world are the American servicemen, they're exchanging ideas with our neighbors in other countries, and they're helping a lot of them to improve their own ways of life. If our men in uniform can help promote better understanding between ourselves and other people, they can bring us closer to the time when there won't be any disagreements or unneighborly attitudes. Do your part in enlarging the circle of friendship. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. Now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was so delighted at Miss Enright's decision to resume her first aid class that he insisted on treating her to an ice cream co soda before taking her home. So they were out of the house before I could reach her jugular vein. <laughs> That's when I got out my Red Cross manual. If, uh, if you're so interested in first aid, Mr. Boynton, maybe we could practice a bit before your first lesson. Oh, I'd love to, Miss Brooks. Uh, here's an interesting problem. Huh? It deals with a back injury. For want of a better subject, let's just say I'm the injured party. Now, you place your left arm around my shoulders. Like this? <sighs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> then your right arm goes around my waist. Like this. What does the book say we should do next? Never mind the book. Ad lib a little. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Byrne, written by Al Lewis and Arthur Alsberg, with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, and Mary Jane Croft. Be with us again next week at the same time. This... Now, it's Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Well, some people are just naturally shy and retiring. But according to Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School... Mr. Boynton overdoes it. Yes, we don't even hold hands when we go to the movies. Except, of course, when I surreptitiously slip him the 65 cents for my ticket. <laughs> even that slight contact could be more romantic if it lasted a bit longer. But the minute he feels a half dollar, a dime, and a nickel, he lets go. <laughs> I remember one night I was 15 cents short. That's the hottest time I've had with him in six years. <laughs> After brooding about this stalemate all week, I decided last Thursday night to give him up once and for all, to put him completely out of my mind. It was difficult to do, but once I had arrived at the decision, I stretched out on my bed, turned out the light, and in no time at all, I was peacefully writhing around, shredding my sheets. <laughs> Friday morning, my landlady had an even rougher time than usual trying to wake me up. Connie, wake up, Connie. Connie, time to get up, dear. Rise and shine, Connie. Hmm? Oh, good morning, Mrs. Davis. 
thanks for waking me. I've got to get to school. What's this? What am I doing with my clothes on? You put them on ten minutes ago when I woke you the first time. (laughs) I should have slept in them. They could use a good pressing. (laughs) I'll straighten your bed while you get your shoes on. And goodness, what made you take all those face towels to bed with you? Those aren't face towels. That's what's left of the sheet. (laughs) I'm afraid I had a very restless night, Mrs. Davis. I tossed and turned for hours. Worrying about Mr. Boynton, Connie? Not anymore. I've decided to call it quits. But, Connie... Oh, I know I've said that before, but this time I mean it. I'm going to forget all about him. When did you arrive at that decision? Yesterday. After another one of our amorous dates in the park zoo... It was terribly disappointing, Mrs. Davis. The more so since four or five minutes seemed genuinely romantic when Mr. Boynton breathed on the back of my neck. When did he do that? While he was looking over my shoulder at the monkeys. (laughs) He's a strange man in many ways, Connie. But I'm sure you can patch it up. Well, there's nothing to patch up, Mrs. Davis. I'm just going to put him out of my mind completely. Whatever you say, dear. Now, please put on your shoes and come into the dinette. Breakfast will be ready in a jiffy. You go on ahead. I'll be right in. Oh, gosh, I'm sleepy. Oh, don't take too long, dear. I don't want your grapefruit to get cold. (laughs) Don't worry. I'll be there in a minute. Oh, Oh, Connie. Connie, would you like some toast? Hmm? Oh, yes, Mrs. Davis, I'd love some toast. Where is it? Just lift your head, dear. It's under your cheek. (laughs) I can't remember when I've been so knocked out. It was those dreams, I guess. I must have dreamt of a hundred people, and every one of them looked like Mr. Boynton. Well, that's the way it goes, dear. The minute you try to forget someone, he takes over your thoughts completely. Maybe if I read the morning paper, I can get him out of my mind. Let's see what the headlines... Mrs. Davis, look, on the front page, a picture of Mr. Boynton. Let me see. Why, Connie, what's the matter with you? This is the Indian ambassador. (laughs) What? Well, I should say the American ambassador to India. But he's the image of Mr. Boynton. The hair, the eyes. Well, on closer study, this seems to be a much older man than Mr. Boynton. Still, there's a remarkable resemblance. You only imagine there is because of your mental conflict. Don't you see, Connie? One side of your mind is trying to boot Mr. Boynton out, while the other side is trying to lock him in. No wonder it's so noisy in there. (laughs) Honestly, my head is just spinning. Well, take it easy, dear. Remember, the one thing most difficult to forget is what you're trying to forget. If you'll cooperate with me, Connie, I'll show you just what I mean with a simple little experiment. Just try to forget an object on this table. Anything at all. Well, the coffee pot, for example. This coffee pot? Any coffee pot. Now close your eyes and clear your mind. Close them tightly. Hmm, That's it. (laughs) Now, Connie Brooks, I command you not to think of a coffee pot. There's no such thing as a coffee pot. No coffee pot at all. Just keep telling yourself you must not think of a coffee pot. No coffee pot. I must not think of a coffee pot. That's right. No coffee pot. No coffee pot. (laughs) Now, quickly, Connie. What are you thinking of? A coffee pot. (laughs) I can't understand it. Something must have gone wrong. Try again now. Are you still thinking of a coffee pot? Yes, but it looks like Mr. Boynton. (laughs) The handle is the same shape as his nose. The lid is the same shape as his head. In fact, the whole thing is... No, no, I'm wrong. It couldn't possibly be Mr. Boynton. Why not? It's percolating. (laughs) Oh, well, I'll have some coffee. Oh, somebody's at the front door. There's the phone. We're a big hit this morning. I'll see who's at the door and you answer the phone, Connie. Hello? Good morning, Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Boynton. Oh. 
Just what do you want, Mr. Boynton? I called to ask if you'd care to join me this afternoon. Where? At the Museum of Natural History. They're going to exhibit for the first time a red-tailed field mouse from France. <laughs> Should be very exciting. A French field mouse? That's right. Well, kiss him on both cheeks for me. <laughs> I can't make it. Uh, I don't quite understand your attitude, Miss Brooks. You sound rather unfriendly oh, this morning. Excuse me, Connie, but there's five cents postage due on this cookbook that just arrived, and I haven't a bit of change. Would you pay the postman for me? He's waiting at the door. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. Hold the phone a minute, will you, Mr. Barton? All right. I understand Mrs. Davis owes you... Yay! What seems to be the trouble, ma'am? Mr. Boynton, what are you doing in that postman's outfit? And how did you get off the phone and over here so quickly? <laughs> did you say Boynton, ma'am? My name is McDonald. I'm the new postman in this district. Now, if you'll kindly give me a nickel, let's do it. Here's your nickel, Mr. McDonald, but please do me a favor. Wait here just one minute. It's very important. Okay. Hello? Are you still there, Mr. Boynton? Oh, yes, Miss Brooks. That's all I wanted to know. Bye. <laughs> Mr. McDonald? Oh, yes, ma'am. Bye. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, why didn't you tell me that our new postman is the image of Mr. Boynton? What are you saying, Connie? Mr. McDonald doesn't look any more like Mr. Boynton than I do. And he's got a thick Scottish burr. Burr? He doesn't have any more Scottish burr than a French field mouse. <laughs> or an Indian ambassador. Now, now, dear, pull yourself together. You see, Connie, when my sister Angela was being treated for her absent-mindedness, I learned quite a bit about psychiatry. Well, what has that got to do with me? Just this, dear. As a result of your decision to break things off with Mr. Boynton, you are suffering from a combination of visual and auricular hallucinations. You see Mr. Boynton's face on other people because you want to see it. You hear his voice because you want to hear it. All this may be lightened to a mirage. You see what I'm driving at? Exactly. You're trying to tell me that I'm perceiving objects which have no foundation in fact. I'm experiencing sensations which have no actual external cause and that I am, in general, blowing my cork. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad, dear Not that bad? When everybody I see looks like... Wait a minute Why don't you look like Mr. Boynton to me? It doesn't work that way, Connie Familiar faces don't change It's new ones that assume his identity most readily But don't you worry, dear I've got the best remedy in the world for your trouble What is it? Diversion I'm going to give a big party here tonight We'll invite the Conklins some of your students, and by all means, invite Mr. Boynton. He should help you forget him best of all. Oh, no, you don't, Mrs. Davis. I appreciate your giving me a party, but if it's just one of your schemes to bring Mr. Boynton and me together... Now, now, don't be silly, Connie. If you don't want him to come, that settles it. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. Well, of course, if the party doesn't do the trick for you, you can always see Dr. Friedkin. He's the analyst who took care of Angela. <laughs> got to school, but spent the whole morning like someone in a dream. Reality seemed to return when I stood in front of the steam table in the school cafeteria and set some lunch on my tray. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. McDonald. I was just about... Mr. McDonald, what are you doing at school? Shouldn't you be delivering the U.S. mail? Miss Brooks, I'm Mr. Boynton. What have I got to do with the U.S. mail? Or the U.S. female, for that matter. <laughs> How's the field mouse from France? Well, now that you mention it, I heard this morning that the exhibit's been called off. The French field mouse never got here. Seems there was a strike and the boat he was on couldn't leave port. You mean he was too chicken to swim? <laughs> if you'll excuse me, I promised I'd join Walter Denton at his table. I, uh, I really don't understand why you're giving me the cold shoulder today. If my shoulder is cold, Mr. Boynton, it's only because somebody blew a big chance to warm it up. I don't quite understand that either. Well, maybe some of your companions at the zoo could explain it to you. Uh, now, look, if there's something I've done that I... Uh, uh, 
Why are you staring at me so strangely, Miss Brooks? Oh, I was just wondering. Mr. Boynton, do you have a twin brother who's a postman? Or an Indian ambassador? Of course not. Do you have a twin brother who's a coffee pot? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, you really must excuse me now. Uh, but, Miss Brooks... Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Walter. How's everything? My cup of happiness is slopping over. <laughs> Here, uh, let me set your tray down for you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, if I may make an observation, you don't seem in a very good mood for your party. I haven't seen you smile all day. Oh, don't let that fool you. The only reason I'm not smiling is because I'm miserable. Don't ask me why, Walter. It's extremely personal. Well, as a matter of fact, while I was changing classes, I saw Mrs. Davis driving by, and she stopped to tell me that I should try to cheer you up because you feel so miserable over Mr. Boynton that she's throwing a party tonight to help you forget him. <laughs> That's what I say. It's personal. <laughs> At least my trying to forget Mr. Boynton should be personal, Walter. Now that you're in on it, I hope you'll keep it to yourself. Oh, don't you worry, Miss Brooks. Only a blabbermouth would spread around a thing like that. <laughs> Say, there's Harriet Conklin. Oh, you don't mind if she joins us for lunch, do you? Well, Get I... over here, Harriet! Hi, Walter. Hello, Harriet. Hi, Miss Brooks. What's this I hear about your trying to forget Mr. Boynton? <laughs> where did you hear that, Harriet? I said, where did she hear that, blabbermouth? Correct, Miss Brooks. But Harry, it'll keep your secret. You can depend on that. Oh, you certainly can, Miss Brooks. Gosh, the cafeteria is awfully crowded today. Do you mind if Daddy and I have lunch with you? Oh, well, Harry... Over here, Daddy. Mm. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Hi, Mr. Conklin. It's always a great honor to share our festive board with the beloved principal of our beloved school. In fact, no other personage on earth would be more welcome to our beloved... Oh, festive... shut up. <laughs> Don't order my lunch, Harriet. All right, Daddy. I see you finished your lunch, Denton. And so, as the Latin saying goes, omnium deriosum nihi disputandum. Uh, meaning what? Get lost. <laughs> oh, sure. See you later. So long, Walter. Uh, now then, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir? What's this I hear about you trying to forget Mr. Boynton? I don't know. What's this you hear about me trying to forget Mr. Boynton? I don't know. What's this I hear about you trying to forget Mr. Boynton? We're in a rut, sir. <laughs> Frankly, I don't care to discuss my personal life. As my principal, you're empowered to question me only on those matters which are pertinent to school business. Uh, this does concern school business. You're supposed to spend six hours of every day in your classroom, Miss Brooks. And yet most of that time, I see you in the hallway galloping after Mr. Boynton like a hopped-up gazelle. <laughs> if, uh, if you really intend to forget him, therefore, I can look for an improvement in your work. I can only assure you, Mr. Conklin, that not only is there absolutely nothing between Mr. Boynton and me, but there's going to be less. Good. Later that evening, the Help Me Forget Mr. Boynton party was about to begin with some strange people whose names Mrs. Davis was trying to help me remember. Some of the guests had already arrived. I'll go set the table, Mrs. Davis. Oh, uh, thank you, Harriet. My, it's going to be a wonderful party, Connie. Let me see. Mr. Conklin is bringing Mr. Abernathy. Walter Denton is bringing a pal from Clay City High. Chester Pruitt, I believe his name is. Then there's Mrs. Foster. Mrs. Foster? A friend of mine who works at the beauty shop. I've been wanting you to meet her for months. Now, uh, is there anyone special that you forgot to invite? Just the postman. I can't get over how closely he resembled Mr. Boynton when I met him this morning. Even his voice was the same. I told you, Connie, you created such a violent mental conflict when you decided to forget Mr. Boynton that your eyes and ears played tricks on you. If you'll call Dr. Friedkin, my sister's analyst, he'll explain it to you in a minute. Well, I'm hoping this party will be all the medicine I need to make me forget that Mr. Boynton ever existed. 
Miss Brooks' daddy is so hungry, he said he could eat his weight in cold cuts. Well, I'm not going to cook a moose just for him. <laughs> He'll have to be patient, Harriet. Is Mr. Abernathy with him? Oh, not yet. He stopped at the store for something. But Walter and his pal Chester Pruitt are here. Cute boy. They're playing marbles on the rug. Now, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> but you ought to go in and chat with your guest, Connie. I'll finish preparing dinner. All right, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Mr. Conklin. When do we eat? <laughs> well, you'll probably eat while I'm carrying dinner to the table. Uh, it'll just be a few minutes, sir. Oh, I suppose that's Mr. Abernathy at the door. I'll, I'll get it. Yes, sir. Well, how are you tonight, Walter? No, oh, just fine, Miss Brooks. Pick up your marbles, Chester. Hey, Miss Brooks, this is Chester Pruitt. Oh, pleased to meet you, Miss Brooks. Whoops! <laughs> oh, come now. What sort of a gag is this, Mr. Boynton? Mr. Boynton? No, no, this is Chester Pruitt, Miss Brooks. But he's the image of Mr. Boynton. That is, to me, he resembles him very much, but then... Uh, would you move your feet a little, Miss Brooks? I want to look around the floor. Wait a minute, I've got to get this straight. Uh, please, Miss Brooks, I haven't got all my marbles. You... <laughs> got all your marbles. <laughs> if I were in the army, I'd be out on Section 8. <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynt... Uh, Chester, how old are you? Oh, I'm 14, but I'm going on 15. I think it was real peachy keen of you to let me come over tonight. I think I'll go lie down. If you boys will excuse me. Oh, hold on there, Miss Brooks. I want you to meet a friend of mine. This is Mr. Abernathy. Oh, I'm delighted to meet you, Miss Brooks. Huh? <laughs> Wait a minute. You can't be Mr. Abernathy. You're Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton? Well, that's quite a compliment to pay a 70-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> Boynton is a young biology teacher at Madison, Fred. Well, bless you, Miss Brooks. If I had my new dentures with me, I'd bite you. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. Will you get the coffee, Connie? Not now, Mrs. Davis. Walter, take a good look at Mr. Abernathy. Okay. Now take a good look at Chester Pruitt. Now give it to me straight. Does either of them resemble Mr. Boynton? Not in the least. Uh-huh. Mrs. Davis. What is it, Connie? What's Dr. Friedkin's phone number? <laughs> I'm ready for the couch. <laughs> that, dear? Never mind. I'll look it up. Oh, come on, Miss Brooks. I'll help you get the coffee. You know, you seem kind of unsteady on your feet, Miss Brooks. But don't worry. You'll feel better after you eat. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I'd better take this coffee pot here and oh, I'll... Oh, not that one. That's the one that looks like Mr. Boyne. <laughs> come again? There's no time to explain now, Walter. I've got to look up Dr. Friedkin's number in this phone book. D-E-F... F, F, A, F, E, F, L, F, R, F, R, I. Into the living room, Walter. The kitchen is just for us girls. All right, Mrs. Davis, just trying to help. Oh, hi, Mrs. Foster. Good to see you. F, R, I, E, D, F, R, I, E, D, K, I, F. Honey, I want you to meet an old friend. Oh. This is Mrs. Foster. How do you do? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm happy to know you, my dear. Mrs. Davis has told me and my husband so much about you. I'll leave you two alone and let you get acquainted. See you later. Uh, you'll forgive me for staring, Mrs. Foster, but there's something about your face. Yes, I know, but it can't be helped. <laughs> beautician or no beautician, I'm not the girl I used to be. <laughs> you can say louder. <laughs> I mean, you look so very much like someone, and yet as you stand here in that off-the-shoulder dress... Oh, I'm so glad you like it, my dear. I made it myself. Of course, I don't do quite as much sewing lately as I used to. You don't? No. <laughs> Not since the baby came. You... You have a, a baby... Well, what is it, a girl or a Boynton? I mean... <laughs> is it a boy? 
Well, my last born is a boy. I have seven, all told. <laughs> Heavens, I don't know what I'd do without the Didy service. <laughs> but, Miss Brooks, you look rather pale. Naturally. My blood just left for Dr. Friedkin. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me now, Mrs. Foster. I've got to make a very important phone call. If you'll step into the living room... Oh, but I don't know any of your guests, aside from the Conklins and Walter Denton, Miss Brooks. Uh, could the phone call possibly wait until you've introduced me to the others? Well, all right. Follow me. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Foster, this is Chester Pruitt. Well, hello, Chester. Chester, Mrs. Foster. Hello, Mrs. Foster. Mrs. Foster, Mr. Abernathy. Hello, Mr. Abernathy. Mr. Abernathy, Mrs. Foster. Hello, Mrs. Foster. Well, now that you've all met yourself... Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. There's one you haven't met, Miss Brooks, in the baby carriage right behind you. Baby carriage? I took the liberty of bringing the baby with me. He's only six months old, and the other children are a little rough with him. Ah, the little doll playing with his rattle... I'll lift the hood back and let you see him, Miss Brooks. Here we are. Oh, what a beautiful little bear. Goo, goo. Oh, no. Dr. Friedkin. Dr. Friedkin. Dr. Friedkin. Dr. Friedkin. Oh, Dr. Friedkin. Connie. Dr. Friedkin. Connie. Wake up, dear. Hmm? Connie. Oh, what do you want, Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis? You'll never get to school if you keep dozing off in that chair, Connie. It's almost quarter to eight. Mrs. Davis, has Mr. McDonald been here yet, the, the new postman? What are you talking about? Our postman is still old Mr. Fitzgerald. He's been with us for years. Well, the party, Mrs. Davis. What about the party you were throwing to help me forget Mr. Boynton? Well, I don't know anything about a party, Connie. You must be... Oh, you've been dreaming, of course. Now I remember. After you'd gotten dressed, you told me that you were sick of Mr. Boynton taking you to the zoo so often. Then when I went to the front door to let Mr. Boynton in, you must have dozed off again. He's waiting for you in the living room. Mr. Boynton, miss? Excuse me a minute. Mr. Boynton? Uh, Mr. Boynton? Here I am, Miss Brooks. Mr. Boynton, do you have any plans for this afternoon? Uh, No, I haven't. Then will you take me to the zoo, please? But, Miss Brooks, we've been to the zoo practically every day this week. I like it. I like it. Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, transcribed, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Joe Quillen and Al Lewis with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Bob Rockwell, and Gloria McMillan. Be sure to be with us next week for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Well, with winter upon us, many women are faced with the problem of either buying a new coat or making last year's do. Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is rather lucky in this respect, as her winter coat is right in style this year. It certainly is. Of course, I must admit that there were times in the past ten years when I doubted that the coat would ever be in style again. <laughs> But after all the wear it's taken, it's pretty much of a wreck. And last week, I decided that somehow I had to get myself a new one. I discussed the problem at breakfast Wednesday morning with my landlady. Why don't you try Sherry's department store, Connie? They've got a lovely coat department. They've got lovely prices, too, Mrs. Davis. Well, there must be something you can afford that'll keep you warm. Oh, there is. It's just that I don't like to go to school wearing a surplus army blanket. I wish I could help you, dear, but with the holidays so close and all, Oh, please, Mrs. Davis, I wouldn't think of borrowing from you. Why, if I just had the money I owe you for back rent, I could buy two coats. I wish you wouldn't talk that way, Tommy. It makes me feel guilty. 
I guess you'll just have to make your old winter coat, too. Have you seen the old gray thing lately, Mrs. Davis? <laughs> no, dear. Where do you keep it? I left it draped over a living room chair last night to air out. If it hasn't rejoined the wolf pack, it's still there. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Was that your coat? Uh-huh. I'll bring it right in off the clothesline. Off the clothesline? Yes, I mistook it for an old rug this morning. <laughs> Why, I must have beat that thing for 20 minutes. <laughs> well, good. It deserves it. Just let it hang there until after breakfast. So that's your coat. While I was fighting away, I said to myself, why am I fighting away? This thing isn't even good enough to step on anyway. <laughs> now I know I need a new code. <laughs> Say, maybe if I wrote my folks a letter explaining my predicament. Oh, no, that wouldn't work. Why not? They'd write me explaining theirs. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned letters, dear. I meant to return a letter to the postman that came three days ago. What kind of a letter? It was addressed to a Mr. Luther Sneed in care of Margaret Davis. Now, I know that Margaret Davis lives here because I'm Margaret Davis. <laughs> but there's certainly no Luther Sneed. Oh, but there is, Mrs. Davis. I'm Luther Sneed. Oh, maybe I'd better get your glass of water, dear. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with me, Mrs. Davis. Where's the letter? Right here on the sideboard. I've got to see what it says. Oh, Mrs. Davis, I've won. I've won the contest. Good. I always knew you had it in you, Luther. <laughs> what kind of a contest did you win? Last Saturday's football contest in the morning dispatch. Really? What do you get for winning? A gift certificate at Cherry's store for a $75 man suit. <laughs> That's nice. Where is in good health, dear? <laughs> you don't understand, Mrs. Davis. The football contest was open only to men. That's why I had to enter under an assumed name. Oh, but Tanya, I didn't think you were so interested in football. Well, I'm not, but Mr. Boynton's been needling me lately about my lack of knowledge of the sport. So to keep him quiet, I decided to prove I knew as much as anybody. Well, this certainly proves it all right. However, did you manage to pick all those winners? With a good thick blindfold and your hat pin. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful, Mrs. Davis? Now I can sell this certificate at a bargain rate to some man and get enough for a down payment on a new winter coat. Of course you can. You can sell it to somebody at school. A teacher, perhaps. Oh, I couldn't afford to sell it that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mrs. Davis. You know, the only one that's cool who might be able to buy it is Mr. Conklin. Yes, all I have to do is to convince him that he needs a new suit badly, and I'm sure I can make a deal. I hope so, dear. Oh, would you like some more coffee? No, thanks. I haven't got time. Walter Denton isn't picking me up this morning, so I'd better get going. What's the matter with Walter? Nothing's the matter with him. It's his car. He had a little trouble with a wheel yesterday. A wheel? Yes, it rolled down the sewer. <laughs> But, Daddy, did you let Walter explain his position to you? After all, he is the editor of the Madison Monitor. He's a lame brain dunce, that's what he is. <laughs> Mad, wanting to start a football contest in the school paper. But, Daddy... I'm unalterably opposed to contests of any kind. I consider them a corruptive influence, eroding the minds of young and old alike and distracting people from more useful pursuits. But what was that sheet you were studying last night, Daddy? The one you tore out of the newspaper? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> don't you remember? It had the names of a lot of colleges on it with numbers after them. Numbers? Yes. It said Illinois by 10 points over Northwestern and Stanford minus 6 over California. Uh, and... The discussion is terminated. <laughs> I was only perusing that column in an effort to fathom what people saw in such context. Now, I'm quite busy, Harriet, so I'll appreciate it if you just... Will... Come in. Leave my office at once. My visits are getting shorter all the time. <laughs> oh, I was speaking to my daughter, Miss Brooks. See you later, child. All right, Daddy. Goodbye, Miss Brooks. Hello, Harriet. My, but you're looking well, Mr. Conklin. I don't know how you managed to do it, but you always look so chipper in the morning. Thank you. 
Now, if you'll tell me what it is. I think your suit has a lot to do with it. If you don't mind my saying so, sir, it's my favorite one. In fact, it has been for some time. <laughs> Glad you like it. Now, if Oh, you... I'm not alone in the opinion, Miss Conklin. Every teacher at Madison who has an ounce of sentiment likes that suit. Sentiment? Yes, sir. You know, there are certain things that we teachers look forward to each day. The old cracked brick walk out front. The old ivy clinging to the old walls. The old initials hacked into the old desk. And your suit. <laughs> well, I admit, Miss Brooks, that this suit isn't new, but it just so happens that my wife is crazy about it. She's told me any number of times how much she likes to see me in it. Oh, so do we all, Mr. Conklin. We love to see you in it. And we like to see ourselves in it, too. <laughs> Many the time I've followed you down the hall, powdering my nose. <laughs> that will do, Miss Brooks. If this suit seems a bit shiny to you, it's only because of the nature of the garment itself. You see, it's a fact. Ain't it the truth? <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it? But after all, why should you care how you look? You're just a hard-working principal of a high school, not some wealthy plumber. <laughs> For your information, Miss Brooks, I care a great deal about my appearance. In fact, I was on my way downtown yesterday to see about a new outfit. Oh, now that is a coincidence, Mr. Conklin. It just happened... I never I... got there, of course, thanks to the involved discussion I got into with Madison's idiotic editor, Walter Denton. Imagine that oaf wanting to hold a football contest in the monitor. Well, he knows where I stand on such skullduggery now. Skullduggery? I consider contests of all types nothing but a low form of gambling. And newspapers or anyone else who sponsors them are accessories to the delinquency of a community. Moreover, anyone under my jurisdiction, teacher or student, who is caught participating will have to answer to me. Now then, uh, why did you stop by my office, Miss Brooks? I just wanted to powder my nose. <laughs> that is, I thought you might want to tell me about something, some extra work I could do for you, uh, or Brooks, scrub the floors. Or... <laughs> Stop percolating and speak. <laughs> oh, what's the certificate you're clutching in your hand? What certificate? Uh, let's see that. Hmm. A seventy-five dollar gift order on the men's clothing department of Sherry's from the morning dispatch made out to Luther Sneed. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what are you doing with Luther Sneed's certificate? Nothing, Mr. Conklin. You see, I'm Luther Sneed. Yes, sir, that's me, Luther Sneed in the flesh. <laughs> Miss Brooks, you're not a well woman. <laughs> I don't know how or when, but... Maybe you've been working too hard? No, sir. It's, it's just a nom de plume. I see. And this gift order, is this some sort of a prize, Miss Brooks? A prize for participating in some obnoxious contest or other? Me enter a contest knowing how you feel about them? <laughs> you did, didn't you? <laughs> Aren't you jumping to conclusions, Mr. Conklin? Don't you conceive it as possible that I could receive this gift order for, uh, the, for sending in the best poem of the week? Poem? Well, it is possible. It is? I mean, of course it is. <laughs> but that's what I did. Naturally, I was a little shy about my first writing effort, so I took another name. But why a man's name? Well, lots of women have written under men's names. There was George Eliot, George Sands, Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe? His real name was Edna. <laughs> now, it's all right with you, sir. I'll I'm be... still very suspicious of your connection with this certificate, Miss Brooks. But, sir, the only reason I came in here this morning was to sell it as a bargain price. If you received this award for anything other than the writing of a poem, say for having entered one of those degrading and nefarious... You want to sell it as a bargain? <laughs> Yes, sir. Would you give me $50 for it? Are you suggesting that your principal become a party to some underhanded and evil practice, some insidious and distasteful affair, some character-destroying temptation? I'll give you 30 30 But it's worth at least... You wouldn't want to arouse my suspicions again, would you? Now, now, here's the money. 
And let's keep this little transaction strictly to ourselves. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Good day, Miss Brooks. Just fair, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> A deal like that is enough to make you go straight. Thirty dollars for an award that the... Well, isn't for interrupting this trip, but hello. Oh, hello, Walter. <laughs> You're going to Mr. Conklin's office, weren't you? I could tell by the way you were talking to yourself. Yes. Well, I've got to get to class, Walter. He's on a big anti-contest kick, isn't he? So I've heard. Oh, gee, every guy in school enters those dispatch contests. I hope nobody around here won this past week, though. Why? Well, because I was down to Sherry's yesterday to get some sneakers, and there's a photographer there from the dispatch. A photographer? Yes, ma'am. He's there to take a picture of the winner when he shows up to cash his gift certificate. <laughs> You'll probably land on the front page. And, Miss Brooks, what's the matter? You look pale. Are you going to faint? That's the best idea I've heard all morning. Move over. priority worrying during the morning, and when lunchtime came, I met Mr. Boynton in the school cafeteria and poured out my miserable story. He listened attentively, and after careful consideration, Mr. Boynton came through with one of his customary clear-headed and sympathetic statements. I'd sure hate to be in your shoes. <laughs> it would be a little crowded at that. But that's hardly an answer to my problem, Mr. Boynton. Oh, dear, I'm so upset I can't even eat. Oh, nothing should be that upsetting, Miss Brooks. Now, let's see if I've got this thing straight. You won this football contest under an assumed name, right? Right, Luther Sneed. Then you sold the gift certificate calling for a man's suit to Mr. Conklin after telling him you received it for sending in a poem, right? Right. You promised to keep the transaction a secret, and now, knowing Mr. Conklin is violently opposed to, to giveaway games, you learn that a photographer is waiting to take a picture when he goes down to cash in the prize, right? Right. You know something, Miss Brooks? What? No, I can't eat either. <laughs> oh, if only I didn't sell the certificate to him. That's my feeling exactly. Well, certainly you, you could have thought of some faculty member who might need a new suit. Didn't it occur to you that I might be open to a suggestion? After four years, no. <laughs> that is, I didn't think you'd want to spend the money. Well, as I see it, there's only one way out for you, Miss Brooks. All right. You hold the steak knife and I'll fall on it. <laughs> no, no, no. You've got to get the certificate back from Mr. Conklin. He's just starting his lunch over by the window. But he thinks he got a great bargain at $30. He'll never sell it back to me. There are other ways of getting things, Miss Brooks. Well, let's see. He's probably got the slip in his inside coat pocket. All you've got to do is get it out of there without his knowledge, and, and your worries are over. At least for five years till my parole comes up. <laughs> You can return his money later. Meanwhile, you, you have your prize back. Yes, but if I go down to Sherry's and get my picture taken, you'll know I lied about the poem. And if I don't go down, I'm out of $30. Well, not necessarily. I'll take the certificate off your hands. You will, Mr. Boynton? Well, certainly. I'll be happy to give you $20 for it. <laughs> oh, but we haven't time for financial details. You've got to get your hands on Mr. Conklin's coat. Yes, but how? Well, right in front of him is a plate of food, cup of coffee, and so forth. If something accidentally spilled on him, one could volunteer to have his coat cleaned for him, couldn't one? One could do the best cleaning job one ever saw. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, your period of indoctrination is over. You've made the varsity. <laughs> now, wait here and keep your fingers crossed. Good luck, Miss Brooks. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Conklin. You enjoying your lunch? So far. <laughs> Have you and Mr. Boynton finished yours? Oh, did you see us all the way across the room? I did. Your conspiratorial huddle was unmistakable. Conspiratorial? It looked like a meeting of the underground. <laughs> That's a hot one, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> may I sit down? You may sit down on one condition, Miss Brooks. What's that? That you do not spill anything on my coat and then offer to clean it in a feeble attempt to regain the certificate you sold me this morning because you can get more money for it elsewhere. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, bye. <laughs> I don't understand this, but what are we doing in Jerry's department store? We're here to carry out a last-ditch scheme called Operation Get Rid of Photographer. Now, if Mr. Conklin comes down here and his picture appears in the... Wait a minute. That must be the man from the dispatch over by the clothing dummy. Which one? He's the one with the camera. <laughs> Look, Mr. Barney, I'll go over first. All you have to do is give me a short time to get the old charm working, and then you stroll over. But, Miss Brooks, what do I do when Just I... Just react normally, Mr. Boynton, and leave the rest to me. See you in a few moments. Oh, uh, pardon me, but could you tell me where I can find the ladies' coat department, you handsome dog, you? <laughs> Cup off, lady. I'm married. Oh, I see you have a camera with you. You must be a newspaper photographer. I can't think of anything more fascinating than being a newspaper photographer. I've been married for 18 years. <laughs> it's such interesting work. I've got three kids. You know, I've always wanted to learn something about photography. I'll bet a sweet, patient, intelligent person like yourself could... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Two of them are bigger than I am. <laughs> Look, lady, I'm here to take a picture for the dispatch. That's my job, and that's all oh, I Hello, can... Miss Brooks. Mr. Boynton, thank heavens you got here in time to protect me. To... <laughs> to protect you from what? From Miss Masher, that's what. Masher? Masher? This tough neck tried to get fresh with me. Fresh? Fresh? Let's not stand around like the Andrews sisters. <laughs> this stranger made advances, Mr. Boynton. Uh, what did he do, Miss Brooks? Do? He, uh, he asked me for my phone number. He did? I did? <laughs> yes, he did, Mr. Boynton. Now, don't just stand there doing nothing. Oh, I, I'm sorry. The number is Ridgeview 8473. Well, I didn't want a phone number. I just... Are you going to stand idly by and let these insults go on a then? <laughs> Don't you think you ought to ask this man to go out in the back with you for a while, Mr. Boynton? Out in the back? Yes. If you don't want to thrash him within an inch of his life, you could at least break his camera. But that's the way he makes his living. Oh, <laughs> Well, if you don't want to defend my honor, I'll just have to defend it myself. Come on, fresh guy. Let's go out and back of the store. Not me. You got the reach on me. Oh, look who's here, Daddy. Miss Brooks and Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Harriet. How are you, Mr. Conklin? Fine, thanks, Boynton. How do you, Miss Brooks? Harriet is going to help me select the suit that's coming to me on this gift certificate that I... Mr. Prepared. Conklin, I'd like you to meet the photographer from the morning dispatch. Photographer from the morning dispatch, Mr. Conklin, principal of Madison High School. Mr. Conklin, principal of Madison High School, the photographer from the morning dispatch. How do you do? Hello, oh, Mr. Conklin. Could you tell me who this lady is? Lady? <laughs> oh! Oh, Miss Brooks. Uh, she's a teacher at Madison High. No wonder I'm glad I never got past grammar school. <laughs> well, Mr. Conklin, I'm supposed to get the picture of the winner of last week's football contest. If you got a certificate... I do not participate in any moronic contest, young man. This certificate happens to be made out to Luther Sneed. Yes, and I'm Luther Sneed. You could have fooled me. <laughs> but I'm not here to take Luther Sneed's picture. You're not? No, that's the name that got a duplicate prize. He, she, or... It was the only one in the history of the contest who ever picked every single game wrong. Wrong? I knew that hat pin was crooked. <laughs> I mean, there must be some mistake. When I wrote my uh, poem... Let's stop this gibberish, if you please. Uh, tell me, Mr. Photographer, who was the actual winner of last week's football contest? A guy named Geronimo Crowninshield. <laughs> Geronimo Crowninshield? But that's the name on the letter that came to our house. I've... I've been carrying it around since 
it's Monday to return to the postman. Oh, where is it, child? Let's have it handed over. Hand it over. Quick, give it well, here it is, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Will you give it to the postman? Don't bet on it. I'll just hang on to this for a while, Harriet. You never know when Geronimo will return to our house. Return? Certainly. He was that friend of mine from out west. Friend? Don't you remember? With all those scalps dangling from his belt? He was the one who spent the week in our spare room, Harriet. But, Daddy, I've been sleeping in our spare room for months now. I meant the spare room over the garage. <laughs> What, folks? I'd like to get this straightened out. One minute, please. Daddy, there's no spare room over the garage. It's just a place for tools. Well, Geronimo here isn't particular where he sleeps. Are you, Geronimo? I said, are you, Geronimo? Oh! <laughs> Why did you kick my ankle, Miss Brooks? Well, what's a little kick to a big Indian chief like you? <laughs> Harriet, you should have told Geronimo you had his letter. You mean Mr. Boynton is Geronimo Crowninshield? No, Geronimo Crowninshield is Mr. Boynton. He just teaches under that name. <laughs> now, just a moment. <laughs> what a coincidence. You're knowing another Geronimo Crowninshield, Mr. Conklin. Now, may I remind you that the photographer is waiting to take a picture of the winner of the football contest. And if your picture is snapped with him, it will not only appear on the front page of the dispatch, but will be reprinted in the Madison Monitor. And anyone who has come out so violently against contest... Enough! <laughs> Harriet, hand Geronimo his letter. <laughs> yes, Daddy. If you will all excuse me now, I'd like to have a little chat with my daughter. Goodbye, Harriet. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Come along, you dear, dear little girl. Goodbye, Miss Brooks. See you later, Harriet, if there's anything left of you. Now, about this picture... Look, lady, I'm confused. Luther Sneed is a woman. There are a minimum of two Geronimo crowning shields, and I almost got clobbered for just getting out of bed today. <laughs> if my editor wants any pictures in this joint, he can get them himself. But I'd like to explain it. Don't no bother. Just wear your certificate in good health. So long, brown eyes. It's just as well there's no publicity, Mr. Boynton. It would only inflame Geronimo Conklin. Well, I, I still don't know exactly what happened, but this certificate calls for a $75 suit, Miss Brooks. And since I owe it all to your efforts, I'm going to give you $25 in cash. $25? Yes, and honestly, Miss Brooks, I, I could kiss you for what you've done. You could kiss me and give me $25? <laughs> of course. Well, better kiss me first. You may have change coming. <laughs> she told me her father was really on the warpath this morning. He couldn't find one of his socks or something. And uh, not now, Walter. Miss <laughs> Brooks, I'll bet old Grouch Puss really blew his horn. <laughs> I can just see him stomping around giving orders. And get me this, get me that. You do this, you do that. Good morning, Denton. <laughs> Tell Miss Brooks about old Grouch Pooh. Stop trying to crawl into my coffee cup, Walter. <laughs> Making waves. Can I get you something, Walter? Cup of coffee, glass of milk, shot of arsenic. <laughs> I'll be running along now. But what about your toast, Osgood? Aren't you going to eat it? I seem to have lost my appetite. <laughs> I'll see you to the door, Mr. Conklin. Don't bother. I'll let myself out, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Osgood. Goodbye, Margaret. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin, sir. <laughs> to think I wanted a boy. Gosh, Miss Brooks, 
Do you think Mr. Conklin knew I was talking about him? Oh, of course not, Walter. He probably thought we were chatting about the weather. <laughs> the weather? Yes, everybody knows it's been grouch puss out all week. <laughs> now, have a glass of milk and forget about Mr. Conklin. What kind of a party is this tonight? Well, my pal Stretch Snodgrass is throwing it. It's a barbecue in back of his father's pet shop. There have been several of the teachers. The more tender ones, I hope. <laughs> It's a very romantic spot, Miss Brooks, and we've taken the liberty of inviting Mr. Boynton. Oh, you have? Sure. We got it all figured out. The moon rises at exactly 7.20 p.m. Now, at 7.21, you and Mr. Boynton will sneak through an ivy-covered archway and stretch his backyard. Now, when you get through the archway, you come to a cute little bird bath. And guess what's in the bird bath? Here is our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, under the direction of Al Lewis. But first... Probably no city in the world is as newsworthy as Hollywood, California. How often have you seen headlines that read, Movie star does so-and-so, or Hollywood hero in nightclub brawl? If it happened to anyone else in any other town, it wouldn't get more than a few lines on page 10. But from Hollywood, it's front-page news. Our soldiers overseas are in about the same spot as movie stars. Attention is focused on them constantly. If one serviceman gets out of line, he's taken as a sample of the entire American army. But we're grateful that the percentage is small. Most of our fellows know that a big part of their job is to build up goodwill between ourselves and other people. But the few who do get into serious trouble make it a lot tougher for the majority who are trying to do a good job. Our servicemen are doing a lot to correct false ideas about America, and they're on the spot, just like a Hollywood star. The clean lights are burning, the cameras are rolling, and the whole world is watching to see how they act. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. <laughs> As it must to all school teachers, final exam time came last week to our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School. That's why Friday morning found me in the dinette for an early and hurried breakfast. My landlady was most cooperative. My fruit juice, Mrs. Davis? Fruit juice, Connie. Cereal? Cereal. Toast? Toast. Coffee? Coffee. Hat coat and bicarbonate? Hat coat. <laughs> Stop teasing, Connie. You don't have to rush like this. I suppose you're right, Mrs. Davis. I did get the test finished last night. At least it finished to my satisfaction. Now, if our beloved principal likes it, everything's okay. How's Mr. Conklin been lately? His uh, temper, I mean. Well, for the past week, he's only been semi-apoplectic. <laughs> Honestly, he's so autocratic sometimes... Oh, that must be Walter Denton. I'll get it. It's pretty early for Walter, isn't it? He's been getting up on time lately to hear a new program. Some disc jockey called Out of the World Oscar. <laughs> Excuse me, Mrs. Davis. Hold on to your beanie, jazz mad. I'm coming. Good morning, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Mr. Conklin. Oh, come in, sir. May I, uh... May uh, you take my beanie? <laughs> no. No, Miss Brooks. I don't want the propellers dented. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought it was Walter Denton at the door. I was just finishing breakfast, Mr. Conklin. Would you care for a cup of coffee or something? I could do with a cup. Thank you, Miss Brooks. Come on into the dinette. Mrs. Davis will be surprised to see you, Mr. Conklin. You haven't stopped by in quite a while. Mrs. Davis, look who's here. Well, Osgood Conklin. Good morning, Margaret. Mr. Conklin says he could do with a cup of coffee, Mrs. Davis. I'll heat some up in a jiffy. Just make yourself comfortable. How about a slice of toast with your coffee? I could do with a slice of toast, yes. Do some toast while you're doing the coffee, Mrs. Duvis. Uh, Davis. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sit right down here, Miss, Mr. Conklin. Thank you. Uh, Miss Brooks, this is not to be construed as a social call. I was on my way to the engravers nearby and decided to kill two birds with one stone. Mrs. Davis and me? Very amusing. <laughs> Miss Brooks, you have probably forgotten that this is the time of year when some fortunate student receives the highest honor Madison has to offer. The coveted silver loving cup so thoughtfully provided by our school's beloved founder, Yoda Critch. Say, it is getting pretty close to Critch time, isn't it? This award, affording added incentive to all students, has always been presented to that pupil who exhibits superior aptitude in mastering that glorious linguistic infant, that heterogeneous hybrid of sundry tongues, the English language. <laughs> now then, Miss Brooks, do you recognize my problem? Of course. How to get those words on a cup without having most of them slop over in... Bird bath. A dirty owl. <laughs> It's a pair of Mr. Snodgrass's prize lovebirds. Now, what do you think Mr. Boynton will do when he sees those lovebirds in the bird bath? Well, if I know Mr. Boynton, he'll close his eyes and hand them a towel. <laughs> no, he won't. No. No, he'll watch the lovebirds and see what they're doing. Now... What do you suppose they are doing? What? They're rubbing their beaks together. <laughs> you see, it's their way of making love. And with Mr. Boynton standing right there with you, well, you know the old expression, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> monkey see, monkey do? Sure. Well, don't just sit there. Hand me a banana and let's get going. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first... On the back lots of the motion picture studios in Hollywood, they have what are known as permanent sets. These are outdoor sets, made to look like New York streets or French villages or something you might see in Baghdad, London, or Tokyo. Standing in one spot, you can see reproductions of practically the whole world. It reminds you that improved methods of travel and communication have made the real world like that. More compact, more closely united. I think people today feel closer together, too. An earthquake in Ecuador becomes a matter of importance to relief organizations in countries all over the world. A disastrous fire in Paris can have its effect on the commerce of three continents. People are beginning to see that what hurts one country hurts all of us. What helps one group helps the whole world. Our servicemen overseas have done their part in spreading that idea. They have shown that the way of life we declare in our Constitution is not a matter of words, but something we believe in for all people. It's an important thing to remember when you're stationed in another land. A country is known by its people. What people think of your country depends on you. Under the saucer. <laughs> That is only part of the difficulty. Before taking any action, however, I want you, as the teacher who will be giving the examination, to have a full say in all decisions concerning the award. Well, thank you, Mr. Conklin. That's Since very... brevity is sorely needed here, I have been casting about for the one word that would sum up the essence of this prize. How about... Then, too, instead of giving a test with merely straight questions, I thought I'd consult with you about the possibility of having a brief composition form a part of it. Well, that's A all. composition that could be judged, <laughs> along with the questions, of course, not only on neatness and penmanship, but also originality of basic thought, clever phraseology, and so forth. That seems... The word which... <laughs> Those qualities of which we chatted earlier seems to me to be the correct one to place upon the cup. However, before going to the engravers, I made up my mind to do nothing without your go-ahead, Miss Brooks. Well, I... After do. all, <laughs> it's only fair that you should have a hand in this. Now, it seems to me, appending your approval naturally... Natch, I got that in. 
It seems that the word unique most closely typifies what we're at. Unique means unmatched, without an equal, unlike anything else. So, Miss Brooks, how about having the inscription read, The Yoda Critch Award for Unique Achievement in English. I knew you'd like it. <laughs> then the matter is closed. Here's your toast and coffee, Osgood. Oh, thank you. Well... We certainly accomplished a lot while you were in the kitchen, Margaret. Yes, indeed. Just shows you what can be done when Mr. Conklin and I put his head together. Ah, uh, it's teamwork that counts, a spirit of cooperation. Oh, that must be Walter now. Excuse me. Greetings, oh, fairest of all possible English teachers. <laughs> Morning, most observant of all possible pupils. <laughs> Come on in, Walter. You see before you a bearer of cheerful tidings. You are hereby invited to a party tonight. Oh, thanks, Walter. I have some tidings for you, too. Come on into the dinette. Okay, Miss Brooks. I just called Harriet Conklin to invite her to the party, and 